story three of lanagan amateur detective by edward h hurlbut this librivox recording is in the public domain story three the conspiracy of one kinda caught you fellows off base nori bradley a star man for the herald drawled it at me invidiously as i entered the police reporter's room at the hall of justice merriman of the times and a half dozen morning paper men their copy turned in had drifted down to the room to await any late developments the ratto story had been on for three days and the herald and the times had put over the arrest of bernardo tosky camerist at the expense of lanagan and myself better shoot a few absence drops into lanagan continued bradley and then maybe you'll land something he's been sober so long he's lost his grip bradley had fared hardly at the expense of lanagan on more than one occasion i was about to fling it back at him when lanagan's voice interrupted me he had entered the room unfortunately just in time to hear bradley's words uh, possibly he said there was an embarrassed pause lanagan had a caustic tip to his tongue and they awaited it now he studied bradley without expression leaning against the door sill but curiously enough there was no outburst it was always difficult to foresay just what form lanagan's humour would take charlie he said at last to bradley and there shaded into his voice a subtle colouring of unconscious pathos what have i ever done to you i have never done you dirt nor any man in the business dirt i have played the game square why is it that i am always singled out like that have i ever betrayed my paper or my friends have i ever brought dishonour to the name of the newspaperman if i have drunk it has been out of public sight i have fought hard charlie fought hard to break the habit it belongs to a past day in our game and irrespective of that i may wish to be remembered around here some day as something other than drunken jack lanagan i can't help it if i have a knack of landing stories i've got to play the game right with my paper haven't i and here in this reporter's room of all places i thought for a little lift and a hand along and you are trying to shove me down his voice hardened in bitterness i've played a lone hand all my life though charlie it seems to be in the cards that i keep it up my eyes blurred because i alone knew how hard he had fought that battle beneath his cynical exterior he had a soul as sensitive to slights as a girl boyishly i made a lunge at bradley but lanagan with a swift move had my arm in that lean powerful hand of his it don't go he said softly we are full-grown men there was an awkward pause then merriman of few words said sententiously it's your move charlie and bradley put out his hand which lanagan took jack said the herald man i'm a cad there isn't a writer man in the game than you forget it then said lanagan i have but as we left the reporter's room together i noticed that the whiteness that had come over lanagan's face remained there don't let it worry you jack i said anxiously don't you bother laddie he did me more good than liquor and i never felt the dragging for the stuff worse than to-night i'm going into this story now for fair and i'm going in to smash the times and the herald flatter than a matrix the ratto case was one that occupied considerable public attention several years ago interest arising in the first instance through the peculiar manner in which the crime was disclosed ratto a wealthy italian commission merchant had disappeared no great commotion being raised for the first few days the police made the customary desultory search uh, the search consisting mainly of the name and description of ratto being read out at the watches in the various station houses the mystery in the disappearance might have remained unsolved for weeks had it not been for a lineman waters who perched on the cross-tree of a telegraph pole commanding a view of the windows of a room in the vacant house where ratto's dead body lay made the discovery no policeman being in the vicinity waters with residents of the vicinity entered the house there had followed much newspaper speculation and police deduction the mafia and the camorra came in for attention the latter organization being one that was at that time 
long before the viterbo trials just coming to the attention of the american regular police and the secret service as counterfeiting of american currency formed one of the camorra accomplishments the peculiar interest in the manner in which the ratto killing was discovered was this three months previously a crime had been discovered under almost identical circumstances by the same lineman waters in that case rosendorn a jewish tailor was found after a several days disappearance by waters at work on the lines who happened to see the body as he glanced through the window of a vacant house from his elevated perch following the discovery of the body by waters the case had been speedily cleared up by the police and proved to be an affair arising from conjugal jealousy waters was a man well advanced in years the strain of the appearance at the coroner's jury and the preliminary hearings in the police court appeared slightly to unbalance his mind the spectacle of the murdered man that he beheld through the windows of the vacant house was constantly before him he was a man who had gone through a placid life and never figured in any scene of shocking violence or of murder after the disposal of the rosendorn case waters became possessed of a mania for climbing telegraph poles commanding the windows of vacant houses here and there and everywhere about the city he might be seen spiking himself up a pole peering intently and scuttling down he was a familiar figure to all policemen and many citizens he made a practice of haunting police headquarters and his imagination beginning evidently to visualize the first scene once or twice led futile parties into vacant houses with the declaration that he had discovered a body the police reporters humored him and he came to know the most of them particularly lanagan who found waters case was of profound interest several stories were written about him and his self-appointed cross-beam task of discovering murdered people in vacant houses and then he made good weeks of poking and prying and shining up and down telegraph poles brought their reward and waters discovered another crime that of ratto he had been slain with an ordinary blackjack which was found by the body during the three days of excitement following the discovery of the commission merchant's body waters thrived upon the publicity that he received he carried bundles of papers containing accounts of his find and with his picture taken in many ways climbing up telegraph poles peering into a window from a cross tree a cameraman nearly lost his life slipping on a crossbeam taking this picture and as he looked ten years ago his last gallery picture unearthed exclusively by a proud cub reporter he was as tickled as a boy and it was confidently predicted around police headquarters that he would find an end in an insane asylum from pure joy in a month but the ratto case did not clear up quite as easily as had the rosendorn case it will be recalled in san francisco that a swift night ride in the police launch to black diamond had resulted in the arrest of bernardo toski claimed by the police to be the leader of the camorra in the west a police theory of attempted blackmail by that organization seemed to have been well bolstered up the local ramifications of the camorra were proved beyond all doubt mysterious persons suspected of being camorra agents who had been talking to ratto shortly before his disappearance were being diligently sought the fear of the camorra by the residents of the latin quarter seriously hindered the police and newspaper men in their work even the native-speaking italian detail of upper policemen making little progress against the terror that the shadow of the camorra threw upon the quarter police and newspaper judgment were slowly settling that ratto's death was due to one of those far-reaching conspiracies of the camorra chieftain and his minions such was the situation at midnight when lanagan and i dropped out of the reporter's room the arrest of toski that we had been scooped on had been made shortly after midnight the night before a sullen hunch on lanagan's part that the crime was in no way reminiscent of the methods of the camorra as he understood those methods from a mass of inquiry and first-hand reading had led us away from the police headquarters just a few moments before toski had been slipped up the back elevator and placed in detinue 
the man regularly assigned to the night police detail at the hall of justice a new man on the beat had missed the arrest working against seasoned men on the times and the herald with their inside sources of prison information however we were supposed to be doing the heavy work on the story so the burden of the trimming fell upon us lanagan was morose he had nothing more to say as we walked down kearney street and turned up broadway i thought he was going to caesar's the original caesar's with the two tables and the marvellous cuisine that pioneered the way for the glaring cafe chantant of to-day's slumming parties but he walked rapidly past caesar's and on to turn in at bressy's a short distance up the slope of telegraph hill it was a dirty little place one of the corner wine joints sprinkled thickly in out of the way pockets of the congested latin quarter at bressy's in addition to the bar there was a little eating place at the rear separated from the bar by dingy curtains one room further back held a piano where on occasion one might hear his ash man or the flower vendor from third and market streets or a waiter off duty from the downtown cafes volume forth the prologue or swing faultlessly through the toreador song just got a tip that they were trying to hook mine host bressy into the thing as a camorra leader was all that lanagan said we sat at one of the tables while lanagan pulled the faded curtains almost together madame bressy she of the famed saute melee was indisposed so the daughter bina would serve us if agreeable perfectly so said lanagan rather with a note of satisfaction it struck me though when i glanced at his face in some surprise for he was a man who was ordinarily unmoved of women it was expressionless bresci went on to his bar after giving orders in the kitchen and we sat there some time in silence long enough for lanagan to send the nicotine of three evil manillas to his lungs i saw that his eyes never left the opening through the curtains then his cigar from his mouth for the moment was suspended in air on its travel back and i followed his sharp glance through the curtain dinoli and alberta two plain-clothes men detailed in the latin quarter had entered the saloon instantly the babble from the voices of many volatile italians ceased the saloon on the moment became quiet save for the rattling of glasses and one click of the old-fashioned maplewood cash register the detectives passed the time with bresci casually sized up the gathering missed lanagan and myself and left instantly there broke forth a riot of sputtering italian the word ratto we heard and then obviously at some motion toward our curtain from bresci the babble stopped as suddenly as it began and within five moments the throng had idled out and the saloon was still bresci demanded lanagan suddenly what were they saying out there about ratto were they camerists bresci's hand went straight over his head corpo de cristo no no he exclaimed paling oh never speak such word here no they say too bad ratto be killed he mopped his brow of its perspiration suddenly started and glanced furtively through the curtains to see whether any one had come in and heard the conversation i think you're a liar bresci said lanagan pleasantly but as i can't talk italian i can't prove it it's pretty funny how that powwow shut up the minute those coppers blew through that door but you better wipe your steaming brow again and beat it back to the bar you've got a customer who is lanagan whispered to me as bresci left no other than lawrence morton of the secret service just assigned here from seattle then he continued i met him the other day on that counterfeiting story at the beach just a shade curious i should say the attention bresci is attracting to-night from the big and the little hawkshaws it bears out my tip morton had a drink or two complained of being tired and drifted casually over to the curtains opened them saw us and was backing easily away when lanagan called out from the darkness he had turned off the incandescent earlier come in morton nothing to get exclusive over switching on the light morton dropped into a chair if he was perturbed at being made he did not show it he was generally reputed one of the two or three cleverest operators in the government service that was good work you did on iowa slim from all i hear he vouchsafed there's a better coming up replied lanagan indifferently 
what brings you to bresci's morton shrugged his shoulders you know the two rules of our department guard the president and turn up counterfeiters said lanagan well lanagan you've got the cachet to me from a good friend the secret service man loses his job who talks but i don't mind taking a chance with you and telling you in confidence that in this particular case i'm not guarding the president being as he is as you know in washington i haven't been sampling any uh, salami drawled lanagan morton laughed you sure are a clever one at that no i haven't come across any that suited my palate i'm particular we had a cafe royal with lanagan pouring his thimbleful of cognac in my glass and morton left the camorra it develops said lanagan have been shipping to this country from blank excellent counterfeit american banknotes they ship them in salami sausages maybe if one has gone astray we will get a slice of banknote with our salami and saute for here it comes on a tray with the fair bina serving bina bresci's daughter was an italian of absolute beauty one of those glowing faces and perfect forms you see in the old italian masters i noticed in a moment that the comely bina had much attention to show lanagan we finished our meal and lanagan led the way to the inner room where the piano was located i had heard him at different times sputter out rag but when nevin's a day in venice suite came breathing softly beneath his fingertips from out of that wrangly piano i could but listen in amazement man of mysterious beginnings he had dropped into the san francisco newspaper game overnight been given his tryout by the brotherhood found to speak the language of the tribe and had thereafter been unconditionally accepted such a mess as the bradley affair only served to emphasize his leadership with the last fine chord of the buona notte there was a stillness broken only by the instant and ecstatic hand-clapping of bina if i ever saw the thing called love shine forth from the human eye it suddenly illuminated those dusky eyes that moment oh madonna madonna cried softly encore encore lanagan zipped through a lustspiel to drop back then to the last composition it was truly remarkable the manner in which he brought the encroaching blindness of the great beethoven sobbing out of the misery of the minor bass did a lot of that sort of thing when i was younger he said apologetically before the wanderlust hit me he was through benna fluttered about him and lanagan's head was close to hers she was a full-sexed creature but young and i balked i spoke to lanagan sharply after a moment or two and we departed she gave him a shy little glance as he left he laughed what a covenanter you are a psalm singer gone wrong for fair i don't like it i said stubbornly but with the best of intentions she's only a child i didn't yet know all the sides of this man lanagan he whirled on me and i got a swift sense of the power that could flash from those dark eyes and i felt with the intimacy of personal experience how effective they must be when working upon a guilty mind let me tell you howard he bit out using my given name for the first time in our friendship nori being his ordinary salutation that i'm working on the ratto story get me what do you take me for anyhow i've stood one whelp for my own kind tonight, and i don't want another lanagan received his second apology of the night but he didn't appear to want it at that his uncanny faculty of reading men's minds seemed to tell him that my remark was in good faith ah forget it he laughed but just for that nori i'll keep to myself for the present the interesting bit of information that binna gave me for bresci is a camorra agent after all and binna who is all eyes and ears knows precisely the truth about ratto's death in so far as it pertains to the camorra i guess that will hold you for a while but what a lover of music she is let's call it a day don't look for me to-morrow i'm off on a little lay of my own keep in general reach of a telephone so i can get you in a hurry and give that slave driver of a samson my distinguished compliments and tell him i will show up when it pleases me to get damned good and ready i hammered away at the routine of the story the next day i was just a plain plodder ordinarily dependable but never particularly brilliant and neither saw lanagan nor heard from him 
a lively angle was given to the story when dinola and alberti discovered concealed in one of ratto's game refrigerators six choice salami sausages that his death had evidently prevented him disposing of in the proper way for neatly rolled in a half-inch wad in the dead centre of each was a roll of ten one hundred dollar gold bills of u s currency the secret service men apprised raged at the information being given to the press claiming that they had been working to round up the entire gang for months and that the publication would serve as warning to the others but leslie more concerned with solving the ratto mystery and hanging it on tosky than with handling uncle sam's minor details and being also a great believer in the assistance intelligent newspaper publicity could be to the police gave the facts out the facts would appear to link ratto indubitably with the camorra ring engaged in the importation of counterfeit currency and obviously eliminated the camorra blackmail theory with respect to his death with ratto now definitely established as a leader of the slippery camorra it was a hard organization to get definite proof on the police were thrown back on a theory of a fight between camorra leaders possibly over some division of the profits or some breach of faith the camorra history shows that it was not nor is not slow to take vengeance even on its own people lanagan was missing the next day again and i was surprised in view of the sensational developments i was following the police lead and it all pointed to the camorra to me nor did he appear for work the third day nor give me word of himself and on this day the police had an admission from tosky that he had visited ratto on the evening of his disappearance it may be well to say here too that the secret service men although working at cross purposes with the regular police had been putting the screws to tosky and morton had finally gotten enough information to supplement his own investigations and in a swift swoop five members of the tosky gang were in the federal cells at the oakland jail charged with handling counterfeit money all in all the situation was growing highly complex for a routine plodder and still no lanagan i had just about made up my mind to go on a still hunt for him confident that he must have broken his vows of abstinence when he called me up his message was curt suggest to sampson to stick personally until he hears from me meet me at once at hyde and lombard sampson usually left the office at midnight lanagan preferred his dynamic energy on the desk when a big smash was on and when he asked for sampson personally i knew he had landed and sampson always preferred being at the city desk when lanagan was swinging home on the bit fine work was all sampson said it was not in his cold-blooded cosmos to show disinterested enthusiasm possibly it was that characteristic coupled with twenty years seasoning at the wheel that made him the greatest city editor in the west lanagan's clothes had that peculiarly hand-dog appearance that the newest suit will get when a man has slept in it once or twice and lanagan's clothes were seldom new so the appearance was emphasized he had evidently found no time either to shave or change his collar worn lines were about his mouth and eyes such as you see in athletes who have pulled off weight in hard training but his eyes those dark mesmeric eyes were sparkling and the old engaging trick of smiling was there began to think maybe i'd lost my grip he said with a short laugh but i have either turned up one of the finest police stories in my time or i've gone plumb crazy we will soon know without more words he walked quickly several blocks down over the eastern slope of the hill and turned into a narrow tradesman's alley i noticed that he was watching keenly before and after us he slipped through a gate in a high board fence and we were in a yard overgrown with shrubbery and weeds the house was a corner one and of that familiar type of old family residence seen in most localities that has gone to seed on a mortgage it was vacant he opened the kitchen door with a skeleton key and we walked upstairs turning into a large room commanding a view of the street he kept away from the window i noticed draw up the morris chair he said facetiously as he squatted on his legs i sat down against the wall and pulled out a cigar but he stopped me 
can't take a chance smell of smoke might give the whole thing away see anything curious about this room i looked at the bareness of it and shook my head examine it he said you haven't even looked it over i knew he was not given to joking so i got up and went over the room carefully the door to the hall was swung back against the wall and i closed it hanging on the doorknob by the leather wrist throng was a blackjack a duplicate of the one with which ratto was slain lanagan was laughing quietly what are your sensations at being in a prospective death chamber he asked visions of being suddenly pocketed in that vast out-of-the-way mansion by a ring of camorists assailed me and i instinctively felt for my revolver don't worry said the baffling lanagan the trap won't spring for several hours yet but after it does spring he went on and this mess is over i'm prepared to present the ferbina with the biggest box of french mixed in town that is quizzically if my puritanical mentor will permit me to but seriously norry his next words came forth rather hurriedly and much as a shamed schoolboy might make a confession seriously these italian girls are mature women at sixteen and though you may not think it i am only thirty-four when it filtered into me what he was driving at i jumped to my feet and pulled him to his jack i cried delightedly you don't mean no he said shortly i don't mean anything now or any other time norry until i've taken a seat on this water wagon that i know i can ride for life my thoughts shot back to that declaration in the reporter's room that i had pondered often since uttered it was clear enough now he was a man's man jack lanagan and looking back now even after the years that have passed since then looking back from the content of my own cosy home the tears spring and i stop writing he did not marry bina that's about enough of that he said i wanted you to get the lay of the house by daylight let's get out of here i've got to see leslie but we were only as far as the head of the stairs leading to the lower floor when a key grated in a lock some place beneath us and lanagan gripped my arm his fingers to his lips his eyes glittering like a snake's we swung back on tiptoes to a small closet at the end of the hall pulling the door almost shut after us lanagan dropped his eye to the keyhole he had drawn his revolver and i drew mine my heart was beginning to thump like a big bass drum there came to my ears the sound of footfalls up the creaking stairs at first it seemed like a dozen men and i concluded for once that one of lanagan's traps was going to spring the wrong way the footfalls disintegrated as they came nearer and i found there was but one person lanagan's eye might have been stuck fast to that keyhole for his hat brim did not waver the fraction of an inch as he held his rigid cramped position for long minute after minute finally the footfalls sounded back down the stairs lanagan did not move until to our taut eardrums came the sound of the closing rear door well i asked him wiping the perspiration from my forehead all he said was fine fine wait a bit yet norrie that was merely a scout taking a last look to be sure that blackjack hadn't been removed by any prospective tenants who might have been here he glanced at his dollar watch it was six o'clock there'll be two good hours before darkness he said we'll take a chance and leave the house uncovered while i get hold of the chief unless you want to stay here he asked banteringly i did not want to stay there but he had me squarely in the door as it were and i had to say i would if he wanted it i sometimes think many a man is made a hero against his will then a great shaft of illumination struck me and i asked here jack why should they bring that black jack here they could bring a dozen with them and nobody be any the wiser but all the satisfaction i got out of that inscrutable irritating man was how bright the understudy is becoming you'll be tackling high sea yourself next however he went on i'm not going to permit you to remain here firstly and mainly because i am confident nothing will happen until after dark although for a moment i thought my theory had gone wrong and in the second place because you might scramble the whole platter on me and get to shooting recklessly we slipped out of the alley after lanagan had reconnoitred long 
he had good reason for not wishing to appear at police headquarters it was generally known that he was off on some sort of a still hunt he had been seen occasionally by some of the boys and it was known too that he was not drinking his appearance at headquarters in conference with leslie therefore might bring a corps of sharp-eyed newspaper men on our trail he got leslie on the wire and within thirty minutes was in deep conversation with that astute thief-taker in the rear room at allenburg's there were few sections of the city where lanagan was not on intimate terms with saloon men there are many times when they can be valuable to the police reporter particularly in the tenderloin and downtown the two did not take me into their confidence but once i heard leslie say explosively jack you're as daffy as a horny toad i caught only part of lanagan's answer he was talking earnestly i tell you chief my information is correct i've got the only leak in san francisco into the camorra and neither you nor the secret service have a man who can tap it it's worth a chance i tell you we'll want brady wilson and maloney we've got to cover every point take no chances of a murder getting by on us and smash this thing right on the nose leslie studied lanagan long and carefully he had never been wrong yet not drinking jack he asked at last not a smell in three months said lanagan you're on the chief finally said decisively i grew restive at not being taken in but lanagan said i was becoming so very bright that a little discipline would do me good hearkening back i suppose to that remark about the blackjack i said no more they outlined their plan maloney was to hide in the yard of the house directly across from the alley gate in that old-fashioned neighbourhood tight board fences and hedgerows are common and wilson across the street where he could command the window to the room where the black jack hung we three with brady were to take our position inside the house the moment anybody entered the alley gate or by the front door lanagan considered it likely that that approach might be taken under cover of darkness maloney was to lift himself to the fence top and strike a match wilson in turn as though lighting a cigar would strike a match and one or the other of us watching back from the room window of the house would know that the trap was set in addition to watching for maloney's signal wilson's position enabled him easily to cover the front door lanagan it appeared had planned the coup hours before and had his coverts already selected their vigil ended on the outside maloney and wilson were then to jump and cover the front and rear doors respectively in case of any miscue inside that might permit of an escape miss q was lanagan's word and i reflected with some apprehension that any miss q with such nervy officers as leslie and brady that would permit an escape out of that house would mean that probably all of us would be candidates for morgue slabs dusk found us all drifting one by one to our stations when i finally entered through the alley door i could see neither maloney nor wilson and yet i knew they had both gone before me and were in position i was the last one in and lanagan was waiting there to lock the kitchen door after me we trooped silently upstairs shoes off and in hand it was an unreal situation waiting there as the deeper blackness of night settled down and the night sounds of an empty house assailed us magnified brady was standing the watch at the window for the signal the rest of us were lined up in the broad hall it was so dark you couldn't see a man a foot in front of you hours it seemed to me must have passed with no conversation save a scattered whisper or so we had tried the hall and room floors and the door to the hall closet and they gave out no squeaks Psst. softly sibilantly came brady's signal we backed into the closet brady in a second was with us the door was open six inches with lanagan and leslie ready for a spring i was in some fashion away back in the rear of the closet a key grated in the kitchen lock and it sounded through the vast empty house with a peculiarly sinister harshness it was a situation certainly unique in crime the stairs creaked there was the sound of heavy labored breathing but there was but one set of footfalls 
we heard the door open to the room where the ugly blackjack hung and as it did leslie swung our door out and silently as so many black ghosts we moved to the other door against the window we could see a man's form dimly outlined and then there was a flash of blinding brilliance a report that crashed in the empty stillness of the abandoned mansion with the reverberation of a twelve-pound gun and under the arcs of the swiftly flashing pocket lights of brady and leslie we beheld stretched almost at our feet as the form toppled backward and stiffened out waters there was a gushing wound in the temple death had been instantaneous with an eagerness that was more animal than human lanagan tore back water's coat ran his hand swiftly through his every pocket and finally with a ha of satisfaction like a snarl pulled out from an unsealed envelope in an inside pocket a page of writing daffy chief daffy is a horned toad well here's the proof written in the hand and phraseology of a fairly intelligent man it was as follows i killed ratto i guess i have been crazy i went crazy looking for murdered people in vacant houses from telegraph poles i couldn't find any more and then i thought i would kill somebody i told ratto on the street that i had seen a man's body in that house and he went in with me i had never seen him before i had left the door open as i ran out to him but he didn't suspect anything i killed him with a blackjack and then found the body in three days from the telegraph pole i had picked out the place several days ahead i got everything ready and came up several times and it was funny no one saw me i thought ratto would get the police but he was nervy all right and jumped right in after me the room in this house i discovered in the same way it was even better than the flat where ratto was killed because the neighborhood didn't have so many people the blackjack is on the doorknob i put it there so as i went into the room first to light a match i could take it off the inside doorknob and hit my man as he followed me in that reporter lanagan and another man were hanging around this neighbourhood to-day he has been talking to me kind of suspicious lately and i guess the jig is up it's funny the police never suspected me i guess i have been crazy all right i would hang anyhow but i am all right now and i will kill myself in the room it's all the return i can make for ratto if nobody hears the shot i hope somebody finds me from a telegraph pole it will give the newspapers lots to write about that's what made me crazy i got too much fame i guess william waters there was a prolonged pause then humph growled leslie savagely the fame you got isn't a marker to the fame that reporter lanagan has heaped on me for the original ass i'm it i took that fellow for a loon jack shake lanagan could not forbear a soft sarcasm that uh, daffy as a horned toad rankled give your men a little class in kraft ebbing lombroso nordau or some of those specialists and you will get a better understanding of the pulling power of crime he said dryly i hadn't figured quite this kind of a finish he went on but the minute he blazed that shot into his brain i was sure he had left a confession if he couldn't get notoriety in life he would in death quickly lanagan told of his suspicion settling on waters after bina his leak to the camorra had told him that the death of ratto was as much of a mystery to the camorras as it was to the police with bresci a camorra leader the wise-eyed and wise-eared little bina heard and saw much that lanagan in turn was told on her say-so he had absolutely dismissed the camorra he set himself to watch waters and for three days and nights scarcely ever let the lineman out of his sight from safe vantage points he had watched waters at his grisly work of climbing innumerable telegraph poles at times he had casually picked him up and talked with him it was evident that he had also aroused waters suspicions he noticed him lingering in the neighbourhood of the house where we now were and finally sneak in by the alley door after he left the house lanagan had hunted up a locksmith secured a set of skeleton keys himself and let himself into the house not knowing exactly what to expect 
he found the blackjack on the doorknob saw the telegraph pole out of the window and in a flash had realized the entire plan of the crazed lineman lanagan assumed that waters would not attempt to lure his victim in daylight he had come back to the house while we were there merely moved by some insane morbidity to visit again the scene selected for the crime picture possibly the slain man on the floor himself peering in from the telegraph pole and then the columns of newspaper space that the room was commanded by a telegraph pole i had not noticed during the day or even my sluggish wits might have given me a hint of the truth the shot seems to have raised no stir outside chief said lanagan briskly when the recital was done call in wilson and maloney and stick around and give us two hours leeway before you get the morgue it's twelve thirty now son you hit the pike with me for the inquirer end of story three story four of lanagan amateur detective by edward h hurlbut this librivox recording is in the public domain story four whom the gods destroy at reardon's much frequented by policemen and reporters jack lanagan sat with leslie that greatest chief of his time discussing one of dan's delectable bismarck herrings and esteem it was not above the very human leslie to mingle in the free democracy of dan's back room where the gentlemen of the fourth estate foregathered to settle in seasoned nonchalance the problems of the world leslie was speaking you haven't lost out jack he was saying but if that narrow-gauge samson elects to fire you which i know he won't i'll give you work if i've got to pay you out of my contingent fund get off that suisse's diet and report the inquirer can't afford to lose you lanagan unshaven for a week looked otherwise disreputable the inquirer he reported judicially can't afford to lose anybody it's a sweatshop life reporting and they fill your place just as easily as schwartz down there on stevenson street fills a place at one of his shirt machines nothing is as dead as a yesterday's paper excepting it has a libel in it and nothing is so perishable as a reporter's reputation the slate is swabbed clean once every twenty-four hours your job is precisely that long rats you're in a beautiful humour they can't forget that iowa slim exclusive very soon no but only because of the fact that i haven't shown up for work since they had given me warning before then i'm through unless they send for me and they don't seem to be doing that as a matter of cold-blooded fact the inquirer likes my work but not my weakness my type don't get much sympathy these days i belong to the generation of the tramp printer the days of a real ethical code in the profession we old-timers are taking the gad what few of us there are left three times over for an even break with these peg-topped trouser boys at ten a week who once wrote a class farce no chief concluded lanagan dispassionately and deliberately i guess i've shot my bolt in san francisco i'll ship on a banana boat and flag it on to panama maybe when i get there i will tangle up in some big complication and another davis will come along to chronicle me with that other derelict a grand story by the way chief a newspaper epic you should read it leslie ignored the morose mood of the reporter shot nothing he said in disgust take a turkish bath and sweat that grouch out of your system here take this ten i want you to get back to your paper you're too valuable a man to be out of work in this town lanagan rejected the proffered money and leslie was attempting to force it on him there was a warm bond of friendship between the two men and a mutual admiration for the abilities of each other when brady from the upper office stuck his head through the door he saluted captain cook sent me over to say that it looks now like that hemingway case was not a suicide after all there are no powder burns on the face the revolver must have been put in her hand after she was shot cook was night captain of detectives leslie jumped to his feet and swung lanagan to his here 
this will put you on your mettle i didn't like the looks of that case from the start i am going out and take hold of it personally come along maybe you can turn up something that the inquirer will be glad to hear from you on come along grady they jumped into the police machine and were whirled out to a fashionable home on pacific avenue it was nine thirty o'clock less than an hour before a report had been received of the suicide of the daughter of the house a debutante whose coming-out party had been an event of the spring before and whose engagement to a broker oliver macandre had just been announced wilson accounted one of leslie's shrewdest upper office men was already in the room when leslie lanagan and brady arrived there were there also a shoal of newspaper men and photographers and the smell of flash powders was heavy on the air on the first report from police headquarters i had been sent out by sampson and had already been in the house for half an hour but i was glad to surrender the story promptly to lanagan when he entered although he did not say that he intended going to work it was wilson as i recall it who had raised a doubt of the suicide theory by pointing out the absence of powder burns although the bullet wound was in the right temple and the revolver clasped tightly in the right hand a girl with her frail wrist must have pressed the revolver close before firing it was clear the revolver had been placed in her hand after the shooting it was an english bulldog of old pattern one of those family pistols found in most homes then lanagan took his leisurely turn drawing up an easy chair if you can't be first on the ground be last was an axiom of the newspaper business that lanagan often tried to impress upon me he proceeded to act upon his theory now by rolling and lighting a cigarette to give all in the room ample time to finish their investigation finally the room was cleared of all save leslie lanagan brady wilson and myself the room had one set of french windows giving out upon a wide porch and a heavily matted lawn it would be next to impossible to say whether a person had escaped over the lawn by way of the veranda the bedroom door was open when a maid attracted by the shot had overcome her terror and run to the room at the time of death the only persons in the house were the mother daughter and the maid marie the maid was in a state bordering on collapse after the first siege with the detectives and newspaper men and leslie ordered her kept quiet for an hour the occasional hysterical cries of the mother prostrated in her own room could be heard leslie examined the body with minute care the rest of us had completed our investigations then lanagan took his leisurely turn drawing up an easy chair leslie brady and wilson had stepped through the window and were examining the porch and the lawn carefully with their pocket lights lanagan had taken one of the girl's hands up in his he was examining an old-fashioned bracelet critically very critically it seemed to me he flashed a sudden quick glance toward the window the chief and the detectives were still busy outside stand at the door norrie he shot at me electrically i sprang to put my back to it to give him a moment's delay in case any of the other newspaper men should drift back to the room i had not the slightest idea what he was after but i caught a glitter of fierce interest in his eyes and i knew him better than to disobey i did not see what he did then save that he quickly placed something within his pocket-book something that didn't have much substance for he had to rub his thumb and forefinger to drop it into a piece of paper some of the newspaper men trooped back into the room leslie entered again frowning in perplexity singular jack he said what's your idea i think drawled lanagan i'll save my ideas for the inquirer chief i've concluded to go back to work leslie stared you've got something he finally said testily what is it something that may save me being driven from town like a beaten dog chief that's all you didn't want that you said confound you anyhow you're too infernally clever go in and win said the grizzled chief but his tone was nettled and there was a natural trace possibly of professional jealousy that he could not conceal 
it had never before happened that he and lanagan had started off on an absolutely even break where it was a straight open and shut proposition of the best detective winning and he felt that lanagan had found a clue in that room that he had overlooked he was a hard loser he went over the room again he examined the body he used his magnifying glass and he scanned the walls the carpet the clothing inch by inch he was still reluctant to give up when the coroner's deputies finally arrived to discharge their melancholy functions the mother was still in hysteria the maid had calmed somewhat and leslie went to examine her with wilson and brady lanagan had drifted out and was sitting on the moonlit porch to which the electroliers gave added brightness when all those blunderbusses get through with their heavy work norrie we'll have a run in with the maid said he i seem to be the last man on the job meantime find out for me how many red-haired people there are about this house or among the immediate circle of the girl's friends it is a matter of some importance because he carefully opened the pocket-book extracted the folded piece of note-paper and first assuring himself that no one was about pointed because there are two broken half-inch bits of red hair that i take it are going to play an important part in this case remember the devereux case these were wedged back of the cameo on her bracelet and they got there in her last struggle with whoever shot her for the time being at least then we will eliminate all but red-haired people maybe it's a dog's hair i suggested hopefully lanagan was on the point of retorting with his finished sarcasm when the hemingway limousine evidently bringing other members of the family or relations summoned by word of the mournful occurrence rolled up to the brilliantly lighted port cashier lanagan's eye had travelled swiftly and fixed upon some object of interest i followed his intense gaze the chauffeur's hair was as flaming as a firebrand lanagan's eyes seemed to be boring straight through the man as the machine came to a stop almost where we sat the chauffeur's face was pale extraordinarily pale it appeared to me as he stopped his machine and shut down the gears there was a perceptible evidence of nervousness in his manner that was possibly entirely natural in view of the shocking happening of a few hours before that had taken the life of his young mistress the first to leave the motor was a trim well-groomed young man whom we at once recognized from the descriptions we had heard as macandray as he held the door open for the other two persons to leave the machine he removed his hat holding it in his hand simultaneously our eyes rested on his uncovered hair his hair if anything was a shade more auburn than that of the chauffeur his swollen eyes and pale face were natural under the circumstances with his marriage hopes thus painfully blasted they walked within and lanagan said come on we'll get first crack at this fellow anyway let's meet him back at the garage in the rear we had started to walk back to the garage as the chauffeur cranked his machine when from the same low window leslie and brady stepped alertly leslie held up his hand to the chauffeur the two officers were beside him in a moment i knew what was coming even before they laid a hand on him i had seen too many arrests made not to know what was meant by that brusque cool manner that quick step that wary eye even before there came that familiar terse short snap of the professional thief-taker we want you the maid has spilled was lanagan's ejaculation as we stepped up to the trio leslie could not forbear a pleased lighting of the eyes as he glanced at lanagan what have you got chief asked lanagan easily the maid marie broke down and admitted that she let this man martin into the house and into the girl's room at the girl's orders at eight thirty o'clock possibly ten minutes later she says she heard the shot when she could summon courage to go to her mistress's room she found her lying on the floor dead the revolver in her hand what have you to say martin nothing sir said martin levelly i have nothing at all to say sir he was a man of about thirty lanagan's subsequent investigations disclosed that he had been with the hemingways for many years formerly working as a stable boy when automobiles came into vogue he had taken a place as chauffeur 
he was a probation court boy when the hemingways took him into their employ and made a man of him as he used to express it nothing snapped leslie well we'll see i guess we'll take him in brady and give him the dark cell leslie swung on his heel and brady giving the chauffeur only time enough to run his machine to the garage took him to the city prison and locked him up but first i had noticed lanagan pick up martin's cap from the seat of the machine while the brief conference was going on and deftly extract something from it the something proved later to be one or two of martin's red hairs other newspaper men emerging from the house had been informed by leslie of the arrest it was eleven thirty o'clock by that time and with the arrest of martin as their sensation the morning paper men of one accord shoaled back to their offices leslie turned whatever ends might come up over to wilson with instructions to keep an eye on the maid marie and went back to headquarters satisfied that if martin was not the murderer he at least could clear up the mystery lanagan started off with the rest but dropped off the car unobserved and returned to the house he was not yet satisfied that all that the inmates knew there had been told you go in and write the story he had told me that chauffeur isn't the type who is rendezvousing with the daughter of the house and she isn't the type to engage in an alliance with a chauffeur there is a nigger in this woodpile somewhere and a red-headed nigger at that go off with your story if you don't hear from me by press time but keep my red hairs out of your story unless you hear from me further i had gathered in my cameraman and artist and hurried back to the office to write a story that i knew would be exactly similar in its facts with those in the other morning papers leading off naturally with the arrest of the chauffeur there were still quite a number of relatives and family friends at the house when lanagan returned the reception hall was brilliantly lighted and he hung up his hat as he did so he examined macandray's top coat carefully and quickly on the collar was one hair it was tucked away labelled in a separate package in the pocket-book he went to the room of the murder to find wilson there sweating macandray the broker was bent over a table sobbing the intermittent hysterical cries of the mother hoarser and fainter as exhaustion came upon her still punctuated the air wilson was reading a letter he passed it to lanagan lanagan read then a startling few lines written by miss hemingway the day before to macandray breaking their engagement with the single explanation i love another you surely could not want to marry a woman who had discovered she loved another lanagan passed the letter back he was anxious to make a microscopic examination of the hair, but he wanted also to put Macandray through the mill. He signaled Wilson to jam, and the detective touched Macandray on the shoulder. "'Get together,' he said brusquely. "'We want you to answer a few questions.' "'We aren't getting any place in this fashion,' added Lanagan curtly. "'Tell me, Macandray, when did you get that letter?' Macandray straightened up, wiping his eyes. "'This afternoon, at five o'clock,' he said." when did you see miss hemingway last there was a long pause while macandray gazed fixedly first at lanagan and then at wilson as though trying to read their minds to learn what they knew because you did see her after the letter you know said lanagan quietly it was entirely a random shot but it went home macandray studied the matter over again for some moments well he said at last slowly i suppose it is best that i tell all i know i saw her last at half-past eight o'clock to-night his head dropped to his breast and dry sobs shook him again for a minute but as to her death i can offer no explanation only you have martin in custody and i saw martin in her room at that time my god he burst out that elvira could have sunk so low a menial a lackey a chauffeur we don't want a dissertation on caste said lanagan with cold brutality what we want of you macandray either here or at the city prison macandray started realizing for the first time that suspicion was pointing his way is a simple statement of how you happened to see miss hemingway in this room with martin and what happened after that i received her note by messenger at five o'clock at half-past seven i called but she was not in i wanted a personal explanation 
i called again in an hour she was home marie said and had gone to her room for the night and under no circumstances was to be disturbed i determined to see her at any cost i knew the position of her room here fronting on the veranda i went from the house by the front door and walked around here to the lawn i intended only to attract her attention by throwing a pebble against the window and compelling her to speak with me but while i stood there on the lawn searching for a pebble an automobile drove slowly down buchanan street and stopped just beyond the hemingway drive behind the pepper tree there were two men in it one remained while the other whom i recognized as martin came to the house entering by the kitchen door of course then i would not risk attracting elvira's attention while i was just turning to go elvira's curtain suddenly was raised and i saw her peering out down buchanan street toward the place where the motor-car was just when that tableau was being presented her chamber door opened quickly and martin entered she seemed to be glad to see him and extended both her hands to him i could witness no more it broke my heart sick and miserable that i had discovered so fine a girl the girl whom i loved sincerely in a meeting with her chauffeur i turned and came away that is all i know later i received a telephone message of the tragedy they sent the car for me i could not understand it then and i cannot now he was sobbing again with his arms on the table wilson stepped over to him brace up he said shortly i want you to come with me the chief will want to keep you where he can see you for a day or two his heavy hand descended professionally upon macandry's shoulder but lanagan interrupted not a chance jim he said shaking his head i don't want to interfere with your duty but i believe that chap is telling the truth absolutely what we want to do now is to clear up the mystery of the man in the automobile martin must be made to talk and by the way have you come across any red-haired people in this case outside martin and macandry it struck me as a good little feature story here's a red-haired chauffeur and a red-haired fiance it's a combination that don't often occur hm said wilson that's curious the chief and i only saw mrs hemingway for a moment she was so unstrung but she most certainly has the finest head of red hair for a woman of forty-four or five you want to see seems to be her own too funny proposition the three of them at that lanagan was staring for once taken completely by surprise so pat did the circumstance fit his theories he glanced at his watch his eyes were dancing with excitement that will be all mr macandre unless wilson wants you for something he said wilson said he was through and macandre left the room now jim let's see marie again i'm collecting red hair it's a fad i have acquired and i want one or two of mrs hemingway's i was never more serious in my life said wilson summoning the maid he sent her for a brush containing combings of her mistress's hair she asked no questions but did as ordered the maid acted like a person in a trance holding up to a certain point and then she will drop like a plummet thought lanagan then aloud i guess we are all through here jim except one last fling with the mother but there was no last fling with the mother she had been given a hypodermic the nurse said and was sleeping from a neighborhood bar wilson telephoned to leslie still waiting at police headquarters to get a last word from his men the detective was still half decided to lock up both marie and macandre but leslie said no lanagan had borrowed wilson's magnifying glass and had spread out upon the bar the different pieces of red hair he was so deeply engrossed in making comparisons that he failed to follow the startling one-sided conversation going on between wilson and the chief wilson whirled around from the receiver as lanagan profoundly stirred carefully tucked away his collection a child could see it he muttered to himself as wilson called out martin has spilled says he tricked the maid who by the way is in love with him into letting him into elvira's room there he declared his love for her demanded that she fly with him and when she refused seized up the family revolver and shot her down maddened by her command that he realize his place and return to the stables where he belonged he escaped through the window after placing the revolver in her hand they are going to book him now for murder 
lanagan took a long time to digest this bit of surprising information he made no comment other than to say you're through for the night now aren't you jim with leslie vouching for martin as the man yes replied jim and now i'm off a moment after he had been left alone lanagan had leslie on the telephone chief lanagan hop into your car and meet me at farrelly's bring martin along it's a quarter to one make time and this is something absolutely between you and me me and the inquirer scoot now chief i've something to interest you since the incident in the room earlier in the evening leslie had been restless about lanagan within ten minutes the police automobile stopped at farrelly's leslie and brady with martin walking between them entered lanagan quickly led the way to the side room one grimed incandescent lit the room pallidly around a beer-stained table the four men sat martin farthest from the door lanagan's eyes were fairly snapping as he opened his pocket-book and spread it out upon the table from it he extracted his little papers each containing a piece or two of red hair he laid each separate hair slowly deliberately before them all upon the table martin was watching the performance with eyes that glistened in the intensity of his interest equally absorbed were leslie and brady deliberately precisely lanagan laid out the hairs two from the brush of mrs hemingway one from the coat collar of macandre two from martin's cap and the two short bits from the bracelet of elvira leslie had understood the pantomime the moment lanagan opened his pocket-book and disclosed the collection of hair he knew what it was now he had overlooked and chagrined but alert he watched each move that lanagan made for the solution had not yet come was it to be martin leslie hoped professionally for the sake of his reputation that it would be martin said lanagan flashing the word out like a dirk might flash in the sun what did mrs hemingway ever do to earn your loyalty even to death martin paled visibly even beneath the sick light of the weak incandescent she's been very good to me sir she took me out of the court's custody and gave me a good home and a good salary she made a man of me when i might have become a jailbird she has been a good mistress sir yes a good mistress came through lanagan's teeth you're loyal the type of loyal retainer you're not the type that falls in love with the daughter of the house you never loved elvira you never murdered elvira and you are concealing now the name of the murderer telling a poor weak lie that could not have stood at the outside for twenty-four hours who killed elvira lanagan had arisen and glowered above the ashen martin leslie was leaning forward his eyes gimlet-like boring into martin's brady swung around too to face him caught as well under the spell of fierce magnetism of the newspaper man tell me lanagan snarled who was in that automobile with you last night martin's heavy lips dropped apart while he continued to stare affrightedly upon the newspaper man the mother of that girl found you in elvira's room with her making preparations for flight with whoever was in that machine i will tell you continued lanagan hammering each word home i will tell you who killed elvira hemingway he leaned swiftly across the table bending down and breathing a word into the ear of martin the effect was electrical no 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 it was i i tell you i and no other i shot her in my fit of madness he collapsed suddenly his head sinking on his breast still gasping huskily forth his protestations look here then said lanagan he held brady's magnifying glass over the hair over the two hairs from the bracelet and then over the other specimens the difference in the texture of the hair and a difference in color were apparent under the microscope even in the ill-lighted room that one of the three specimens was similar hair to that from the bracelet was apparent almost to the naked eye leslie's face grew grave brady had absolute unbelief written in his eyes martin took one peering look furtively that hair said lanagan indicating came from elvira hemingway's bracelet it lodged there in her last struggle with whoever killed her this is your hair martin compare it this is macandre's compare it this is from the mother's head compare it a red-haired person killed elvira 
it was not you it was not but martin had sunk his head into his arms on the table with a groan lanagan waited leslie waited brady waited experts all at the third degree mind was mauling matter and mind was winning it was not you continued lanagan pitilessly as martin lifted his haggard face with the look of pleading of an animal in his eyes it was not you but it was not she not my mistress it was me me the last words were a shriek but the tax on his self-control had been too great he fainted they threw water on martin then and forced whiskey down his throat he came to staring in confusion from one face to the other you have admitted the mother shot her own child said lanagan rapidly giving martin no opportunity to recover his composure now tell us the circumstances of this unnatural crime martin's breakdown was complete elvira hemingway practically forced into an engagement with macandray largely through propinquity he was her brother's partner and a regular family guest and through the wishes of her mother inordinately ambitious socially to ally her daughter with the macandrays had finally jilted macandray for a struggling young doctor stanton a classmate at college they were to have eloped so greatly did the girl dread the scene that she knew would follow when her mother learned of her dismissal of macandray martin loyal as he had said to his mistress but still more so to the daughter of the house was party to the elopement he had come to her room by prearrangement to help her out with a grip or two in order that no suspicion would attach should she be discovered in the room on the porch or crossing the lawn the machine the same that macandrey saw was waiting at the pepper tree but while martin was in the room the mother on some slight errand had unexpectedly gone to her daughter's room there she found her daughter fully attired the french window wide open and caught a flashing glimpse of a figure disappearing through the french window that she recognized as martin at first flush she accepted the incident as an interrupted rendezvous of some sort between her daughter and her chauffeur and one hot word of charge had brought a swift retort from the daughter and a quarrel had arisen martin sneaking back to report progress in the room to stanton heard the rising voices in anger and learned enough to know that the girl under stress of her excitement had revealed the plan for the elopement he counseled with stanton and both agreed that stanton had best retire and await developments martin to keep stanton posted by telephone in the grief and excitement of the final tragedy he did not do so and the lover worn by a sleepless night received his great blow when he opened his morning paper but this is not a tale of love or lovers except in so far as they concern the solution of a crime and stanton therefore with his blighted life passes out of the story martin determined to intercede in hope of softening the lot of the daughter taking all blame to himself as the messenger of the secret lovers hurried then back to the house some primal strain of vulgarity some poignant pang of disappointed motherly ambition or possibly some pang of personal ambition thwarted led to the utterance of one malediction sharper than all the others by the mother in a moment of sudden hysteria the old-fashioned revolver that had been on her mantelpiece for years had been seized by the daughter in a wild threat of suicide the mother seized her wrist a violent physical struggle for the weapon followed this was occurring just as martin was making his way back through the house to the rooms taking along with him the maid marie huddled frightened against the hall wall at sound of the unseemly family quarrel there was a flash and a report in his very eyes as martin opened the door the revolver he said was unmistakably in the mother's hand but whether the discharge was accidental or intentional in heat of passion martin could not say and that angle of the story never was cleared up the mother had swooned when it was clear to the frightened servants that the girl was dead they had carried the mother to her room the plan of the two was quickly formed in their clumsy way they concluded it would be best for all concerned if the revolver should be placed in the girl's hand to indicate suicide 
martin placed it there while marie labored with the hysterical mother trying to instill in her mind in which the entire terrible scene was a whirl the idea that elvira had in fact committed suicide as for the confession i feel i was to blame in a way sir concluded martin wiping his eyes after all i would have been a jailbird anyway if she hadn't saved me most like i thought i could protect her too sir by confessing i suppose if i said i committed the murder that would settle it lanagan glanced at his watch it was half past one there's one more move yet chief he said and i go to press in thirty minutes in a moment or two they had all reached the hemingway home again surprised to find it brilliantly lighted servants were running about frantically an excited voice was at the telephone as the quartet walked through the door it was the butler hurry hurry he was crying hemingway specific avenue for god's sake hurry what is it demanded lanagan carbolic i think replied the butler she escaped from the nurse and got to the bathroom she had been raving for an hour entirely out of her head crying to elvira to forgive her that she he stopped suddenly his lips coming together in a taut line another loyal family retainer thought lanagan as he and the chief exchanged quick glances only this one can keep his secret for all of me they hurried to render first aid but one look convinced the reporter and the policeman used to death in violent form that the troubled and frightfully burdened mother's soul had gone to a higher court for judgment lanagan raced back downstairs for the telephone it was five minutes to two by the accident of being on the ground he would have at least that tremendous exclusive of the mother's suicide and that good story as it was was all the inquirer printed for it was all that i finally got from lanagan just before the clock struck two leslie standing by the telephone said tentatively and curiously when the receiver was hung up what about the real story saving that for tomorrow no chief drawled lanagan full brother in the fourth estate no chief that's all the story she's dead isn't she they have had about enough trouble this family end of story four story five of lanagan amateur detective by edward h hurlbut this librivox recording is in the public domain story five the ambassador's stickpin the manner of lanagan's acquiring the ambassador's stickpin is nearly if not quite as interesting as the matter of his losing it his possession of the pen was simple enough when one understands the chromatic ways of a police reporter's daily routine and jack lanagan was the star police reporter of the city the surrender of the pen is as easily understood when one comes to learn something of the devious paths the police reporter is sometimes called on to follow and the curious and startling situations into which they sometimes lead thus when lanagan drifting indolently with the matinee throngs down powell street stopped to hold confab with kid monahan that now retired king of the pickpockets it was natural enough that he should remark on a stickpin of odd design that replaced the accustomed three carat in the king's silk cravat gentry who lived by their wits and other people's wealth affect stones of much size some policemen wear them too it was natural enough that the king proverbially generous noticing the glance of interest should say here wear it and with a motion as quick and as deft as a hummingbird's flit transfer the pin from his tie to that of the newspaper man it was then for lanagan to observe dryly your title is certainly earned as he extracted the pin and offered it back but this being a pin of very unusual design i am afraid i might not be able to wear it as gracefully while awaiting the possible appearance of its owner as can you further that little exhibition of refined touch you just gave excites some grave suspicions that you are back at your old tricks the one-time king knew lanagan's outspoken ways further he knew perfectly that while the police accepted his declaration since his last time out of fealty to the law he was a two-timer the police were using him or thought they were as a stool lanagan did not think so 
if it hadn't been for what lambroso classified as the criminal lobe i might really believe you had reformed lanagan had told him once but in view of the lynx-like quality of your ears to be all top and no bottom i am afraid the stamp of an extremely low moral resistance is indelibly upon you and monahan had only grinned then as now in his ingenuous way uncomprehending and exalted lanagan a notch or two for some minor favour in times gone past lanagan had earned and held steadfastly the king's unswerving loyalty not an insignificant asset for a police reporter jack said the king in pained sincerity i'm not passing you no chance got it down at small's was shoved for a finner and i took it out of curiosity funny sticker ain't it if anybody does make you though why of course hand it over i like my old spark better anyhow small be it said was probably the thriftiest and crookedest fence inside the county with the headquarters men on the pawnbroker detail taking orders and percentages from him as faithfully as they reported to their captain of detectives with another of those flits the king placed back in his own necktie his customary brilliant taken from his vest pocket before lanagan could offer the other pin back the second time his companion had left lanagan examined the pin critically it was a funny sticker round of gold and the size and thickness of a quarter the back was plain fitted with a patent clasp on the face was a delicate relief of two eagles heads out an eye a ruby for an iris was in the exact centre below the eye were two clasped hands and above two crossed swords woven around the entire design was what he at first took to be a snake but discovered on closer scrutiny to be a rope it was a delicate and unusual product of the goldsmith's art lanagan puzzled over it for an hour and then concluded russian from the eagles emblem of a secret order evidently from the eye the clasped hands to signify that an oath has been taken and the axe or the rope is the headman or the hangman for a breach of faith that sounds plausible but what particular society does it represent he placed it in his tie and was recalling what he had read about russian secret societies when he was bumped violently by a short swarthy individual who had unknown to him been following as lanagan straightened up he caught a quick flash as of a message of tacit understanding in the other's eyes as he gazed straight at the pen in another moment a black flat wallet thin and oblong had been slipped adroitly into his inside coat pocket a word which sounded like scoria had been whispered in his ear and the singular stranger had departed to the street to jump aboard a passing car and disappear toward the ferry lanagan made it a rule to be surprised at nothing to accept nothing as coincidence not proved so and to ignore no trifles he was interested highly interested and he wanted to know what scoria meant that there was a connection between the pen and the wallet was to him clear possibly scoraya might help him in fogarty's back room hard by police headquarters he found petrov russian interpreter in the police courts what does a word that sounds like scoraya mean he asked it means hurry at once or any such meaning it is what you americans say get a move on said petrov sitting apart lanagan unfastened the black sealskin wallet and drew out a single sheet of paper encased in a protection of oiled skin there were written on the paper in a bold strong hand an even dozen words words that sent his breath whistling through his teeth it was in english plain clear and signed by a name that gave even the imperturbable lanagan a mighty start undoubtedly mused lanagan they either have a system believed infallible or they are mighty reckless of state secrets and they are not reckless therefore the system has slipped a cog and i am the anointed bearer of the message of his serene majesty nicholas i appear to be on the knees of the gods he went on as he wandered the streets perplexed it's possible barely possible that i am tangled in some monumental hoax but i don't believe it 
if i don't miss my guess i will be giving the austere mr sampson damned of all men of my tribe the biggest exclusive his sweatshop paper has turned out in this generation but i need more coincidences i am plainly stumped he had stopped by lotta's fountain where the traffic patrolman was endeavouring to untangle a jam of trucks and automobiles out of the very air as though in weird solution to his perplexity it came again scoraya lanagan wheeled to find the voice he had thought he must turn directly upon the man there was no one near him save the occupant of a limousine two feet away the passenger was apparently engrossed in the evening paper the window though was open lanagan watched him covertly from the corner of his eye hmm this is getting interesting here am i a live newspaper sprout in the dead centre of a bustling and workaday american city caught as sure as the sun shines in the mysteries of a diplomatic maze between two great nations and probably three that is as twisted as a medieval intrigue at this moment the whereabouts of little me and my message are probably of as much importance as the comings and goings of the czar the mikado or the first gentleman himself but the next gay cat that tries any scoraian on me will get the third degree right in fogarty's back room the limousine the traffic jam relieved pulled slowly ahead but lanagan could have sworn that the benign gentleman within just before it did turned fully upon him with a scrutiny of deliberate coolness it was a casual thing such as might have happened to any one but it appeared to lanagan that there was a look of secret understanding in the other's eyes as they dropped twice to the stick pin and returned to lanagan's face as though in inquiry lanagan took the number of the car eight nine seven seven six and then returned to headquarters he wanted to see from the police register to whom machine eight nine seven seven six belonged when he ran through the pages to the number the ragtime air he was whistling very incorrectly quickened in tempo eight nine seven seven six owner boris koshloff two 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 four pacific avenue san francisco aha either i am hearing scoraya's in my mind and either everybody that looks at me excites my suspicions or else the russian mr kozloff is a link in the very plain chain that is stretching from me and my pen to his majesty nicholas at st petersburg on one end and the president in washington at the other frankly it looks preposterous that if kozloff is on the job he would use his own machine then again what if that is the method chosen to point my path to me if this message is to someone in san francisco they must know by this time that it has gone astray barring my own coincidence in bungling into state secrets via kid monahan's touch and his taste for the really distinctive in jewelry it appears that everything is working out on a very remarkable and finished system i will pay mr koshloff a visit he has been too much of a figure of mystery in this city anyway boris koshloff a wealthy russian portrait painter had dropped into san francisco with introductions some months before he had earned a high repute for the elegance of the soirees given at his house and had figured in the public prints moreover in other ways on one occasion a burglar found prowling within the koshloff's drawing-room had been shot and killed by koshloff who thereupon was lionized to a considerable extent by the neurotic and sentimental elements of his circle he had figured again when a household servant had fallen from his second-story window receiving frightful injuries although during his raving in delirium the servant had cried frequently spare me spare me and had led some cynical reporters on the hospital beat to suspect foul play nothing was ever proved in face of koshloff's explanation that the servant fell in cleaning windows after the man recovered sufficiently he was removed by koshloff to a private hospital and there he passed from the scope of the news-gatherers and hence from public attention 
now it might be well to say here and before the reader is too far carried away by the story that the curious chronicles of the happenings about to be recorded must rest for all time for their authentication in five quarters the russian government the american department of state jack lanagan king monahan and myself it is not probable that either the russian or american governments would affirm the truth of the facts recorded as for the rest the extraordinary series of complications following the receipt of the stick pin the use of such a device as the stick pin as the connecting link in a grave international crisis the use of the personal courier rather than cipher code they must all be accepted on my word the word of lanagan or the word of king monahan who first received the pin to such as are unwilling to accept that proof the story must be read solely as a bit of fiction lanagan strolled back to the inquirer i had just finished several yards of real estate junk for the business office and was as grouchy as the brother of the tribe always is when assigned to do business office write-ups fine line for an able-bodied reporter said lanagan cynically looking over my shoulder turn that rod in and come with me and be a real reporter i'll give you a story that will make the a p wires hum to the four corners of the earth provided my hunch don't go altogether wrong he spoke to sampson telling him that there was a bare chance of something turning up on the russo-japanese situation and asked for me to be detailed to accompany him good replied sampson get after it we haven't broken a story on that yet the eastern papers are having a lot of stuff on the secretary of state though he has dropped out of sight the a p is bringing in a story broken by the sun that his supposed sickness was the bunk and that as a matter of fact he has been out of washington for a week supposed to be in new york on some confab with the russian ambassador who is at the waldorf astoria the ambassador denies any such conference it's a hot yarn try to turn up an end on it out here lanagan suggested supper and as we lingered over our coffee and cigars he briefly outlined the situation i read the astounding message and must confess that i was stirred to a very unprofessional pitch of excitement before taking a car for pacific avenue we dropped in at police headquarters where lanagan met chief leslie that shrewd thief-taker and they were in earnest talk for ten minutes in his police reporting lanagan had the superlative advantage of leslie's confidence that famous chief had indeed as high a regard for lanagan's work as for that of his own men leslie stood many a roast from the opposition papers for his habit of programming with lanagan and for turning over his men to the service of the newspaper man more than once as we rode to our destination lanagan instructed me to take a position well concealed opposite the kozlov house wait until midnight and then if he did not appear telephone to headquarters where brady and wilson two of leslie's best men would be in readiness with the police automobile we were to force the house for it is just possible said lanagan lightly that i can't escape delivering my packet if they once drop to me it may be interesting that burglar shot by kozlov takes on rather a new importance likewise that foreigner who was all broken up in an accidental fall from kozlov's second-story window i rather look forward to a run-in with this gentleman of mystery and his retinue of scoriers but don't wait after midnight brady will have a search warrant on some phony charge or other and you can tear right in we parted company several blocks from the koshloff mansion it was nearing nine thirty i found a hiding place almost directly opposite slipped in and in a few moments saw lanagan walk briskly up the stairs of the russian house he was whistling a bit of ragtime as usual off-key his insouciance cheered me frankly i was nervous a weakness i cannot seem to overcome i have never failed lanagan yet in a crisis and i suppose on results am as brave as he but in my own heart i know i am not possibly gifted with a little more imagination than he i can see further picture the slab on the morgue the gang in the police reporter's room chipping in for a floral piece while somebody tries to relieve the strain by saying something funny 
johnny o'grady or jim bradley or some of the others of the old guard delegated to the pleasant detail of carrying the news home it was always the same i always had that faculty as hamlet says of thinking too precisely on the event the door opened to lanagan's ring and he passed from my sight to be ushered along the main hall down a flight of steps through another long hall carpeted richly with niches here and there holding exquisite statuary to a billiard room panelled in richest mahogany from the conduct of his guide it was apparent that he was expected in the billiard room two smooth-shaven trim keen-eyed men were playing a desultory game surmise was bulking large within lanagan's breast he had seen that same type before secret service was stamped as indelibly upon them as his vocation is stamped upon the upper office man a light tattoo on a panelling an answering tattoo another staccato and the panel slid back and the odour of black cigars was heavy on the air as lanagan stepped into a small compartment the panel slipping noiselessly shut behind him as his guide disappeared at a table were seated two men facing him one of the two he recognized koshloff but the other lanagan looked hard there could be no mistake those features had been looming from the front pages of the papers too frequently for any mistake lanagan stood without speaking but before his mind's eye was dancing the front page of to-morrow's inquirer he would lay a seven-column lead across that page that would carry around the world it was koshloff who spoke you have the packet yes would you present it then in a low voice to the other as lanagan calmly placed the sealskin wallet upon the table koshloff murmured assuredly my superiors must know their business but i cannot comprehend the disappearance of carlos and the transfer of the pin and packet to the stranger it must be in order however our system has never failed he turned a shrewd gaze upon lanagan studying him intently when do you return he asked finally just as soon as i am permitted to replied lanagan with perfect truth strange muttered koshloff in the other's ear peculiar it is the answer we have no choice it must be in order without more ado the packet was opened and koshloff presented the slip in silence to his companion that man of massive intellectual forehead and deep-set penetrating eyes scanned it carefully and pondered long koshloff watching him with half-closed but eager eyes tell your imperial master said the other turning sharply upon lanagan and speaking with clean incisiveness that you met the secretary of state in person and that the secretary speaking for his excellency the president says that the answer of the president is yes the secretary of state ten days disappeared from washington out here on the western fringe of the continent pledging the attitude of the united states in the threatened russo-japanese conflict and not a line in any paper in the world to indicate the whereabouts of the secretary his business or the definite attitude of the united states in the impending conflict it was the story of a newspaper man's lifetime carry the verbal message or transmit it to your relief instructed koshloff conditions may not make packets safe by the time you reach the orient you may go you have funds your pen is safe i have said lanagan who with two days to go to payday had about sixty-five cents he indicated the pen with a gesture and turned on his heel for the panel to be stopped by a sudden muffled uproar from the billiard room a sound of excited shrill cries of scuffling neither the secretary nor koshloff moved a muscle neither did lanagan he was thoroughly in possession of himself two panels swiftly and noiselessly slid open at the farther wall of the room and two smooth-shaven trim keen-eyed men stepped into the room alertly and took their places beside the secretary's chair mr secretary travels with the entire secret service bureau lanagan found time to comment to himself there came a tattoo on the panel from the billiard room the secretary held up his hand for silence and motioned one of the secret service agents who stepped noiselessly to the panel and listened the tapping came again 
answer commanded the secretary it is over whatever it was the panel slid open through the aperture came one of the billiard players flashing a quick steely glance upon lanagan balked by the eternal shot through lanagan's mind the owner of that pin has shown up it's now or never he stepped casually to the panel it was a fine chance once through there he could make a fight for the front door and the seven column exclusive in the inquirer directly before him fairly filling the space of the panel was the other billiard player it was quick action lanagan shot out his right for the man's jaw but his arm got about half way a grip like an iron clamp had him just above the elbow he was whirled face about a secret service man on either side as though nothing had happened the man who had first entered through the panel door spoke there is a person outside somewhat excited who wishes to speak to mr koshloff he said to say it was carlos koshloff leaped for the doorway and in a moment more had dragged fairly by the hair of his head a wild-eyed dark-visaged person who when he straightened up perceived the pin in lanagan's tie and made a tigerish spring for him a dirk gleaming in a half arc as he leaped but the right fist of one of the secret agents met him en route and the frenzied carlos was disarmed he staggered to his feet striving vainly to get at lanagan thief robber death to him death to him who dares rob the messenger of his imperial majesty nicholas the gentleman appears to be teething remarked lanagan koshloff pressed a button and two swart giants appeared he indicated carlos with a nod he wore the pin but he has failed in his obligation he must receive discipline the miserable wretch fell to his knees with upraised hands supplicating oh no sire my wife my babies ten minutes too late or i would have had it back and this sneak thief's life but koshloff frowned impatiently and in a second more carlos was whisked away a weird scream floating back wearily from some hidden corridor to indicate the terror that gripped him there was something in that scream of fear of more than the knout as it rang through lanagan's ear he recalled the crossed axes and the hangman's noose of the pen it was clear enough there would be another burglar killed he whirled upon koshloff professor koshloff or whoever or whatever you are he said in a tone of deadly acidity that man is turned up out of here unharmed by so much as a scratch or i'll have you snaked into the city prison within twenty-four hours and some other very general suspicions will incidentally be given an airing you may be the right eye or the right hand of his serene majesty nicholas but i'm jack lanagan of the san francisco inquirer and in my own particular bailiwick something of a czar myself you're a long way from russia right now you're in little old san francisco do you get me the cat-like quality of lanagan's eyes to glow under the stress of anger or great excitement exhibited itself his face in anger was not what was calculated to put infants to slumber he had forgotten the secretary for the moment the agents had all withdrawn he was recalled to him when that person taking his cigar from his teeth and gazing upon its ash contemplatively said in even tones i think possibly you are unduly exercising yourself something of a czar the smooth voice went on indeed and it is a pleasure to meet the czar of the bailiwick of san francisco and the secretary bowed profoundly and gravely now let us talk business mr lanagan as for carlos his case is absolutely ex-territorial so far as we are concerned please inform me how you came by that packet and pen eavesdropping in matters of state do you young men of the press hold nothing sacred not your country's peace or the peace of other nations so far as that goes retorted lanagan coolly and not condescending to take note of your eavesdropping we young men of the press have a duty to our papers which our papers in turn owe to the people in this case it is a clear duty by what right do you or any other man president or not arrogate to yourself the power to hold this secret caucus resting your country's stand in this grave affair entirely upon the judgment of one or two men you are the servant of the people let the whole people know where you are now and what you are doing 
get the sentiment of your country before you plunge into this agreement i personally most emphatically disagree with the answer you are sending back the public are as likely to think my way as yours the secretary looked bored it is not possible with this exception grimly lanagan turned for the panel and sought the spring it is ten minutes after twelve he said laconically i must leave here open the door if you please neither man moved the secretary said we have not quite covered our ground you have not answered my question the pen i received from a friend who claimed to have taken it from a pawn-shop the packet was put in my pocket by a swarthy man who met me on the street and who said scoraria so did another chap in kozlov's automobile i wanted to see the thing through that so accidentally came my way now when i came in here i did not come alone i am fully aware that nations planning wars to cost hundreds of thousands of lives would not scruple at one my friends should be breaking in here now i told them to give me until twelve o'clock so far as your man carlos is concerned i can only surmise that he was to meet a courier at the steamer but had his pen stolen from him the courier then wandered the streets seeking the pen and by happy chance tumbled against me wearing it and likewise wandering the streets the other skoraya boy i presume was one of kozlov's secret service men sent out to see that the messenger reached here safely he must have likewise picked me up on the matinee promenade by accident correctly reasoned murmured kozlov and i believe you have cleared the situation a most remarkable series of coincidences but then anything may happen in this remarkable city of yours do i go peaceably asked lanagan glancing at his watch his voice hardened a trifle it was twelve thirty after a um, bit purred kozlov and the next instant was gazing coolly into lanagan's police colt kozlov lifted his hand with an indolent gesture to push the muzzle to one side took a look into lanagan's eyes thought better of it and turned with mock deprecation to the secretary that gentleman was watching lanagan with frank admiration we've got a place for you mr lanagan he said heartily any time you care to come to washington lanagan was nettled here were keen quick-witted level-headed men poking quiet fun at his spectacular display because they were of the quick intuitions of the exceptional mind they fathomed his mind and knew that he would not shoot lanagan felt rather boyish for a fleeting second got himself in perspective as it were and grinned at the grotesqueness of the situation then that seven-column scare-head in the inquirer the exclusive that was to hum around the world focused before him open that door kozlov arose then there is something singularly compelling about a blue-nosed revolver six inches from your temple regardless of any psychological conviction you may have that the man is not going to use it but whether lanagan would have carried the situation through successfully cannot be answered for at that moment there came a tapping on the panel kozlov stopped at a signal from lanagan the tapping came again the secretary spoke the situation is becoming strained however diverting it may be to all of us for my part here are three men all presumably of minds trained to meet sudden exigencies and yet no one of us can solve this one but other matters seem to be pressing the tapping was becoming more insistent let us call a truce mr lanagan of precisely ten minutes at the end of that time i give you my word we will return matters to just their present condition it is agreeable absolutely said lanagan pocketing his revolver koshloff sprang across the room and tapped he was answered to his satisfaction for the panel slid open and after a whispered consultation with one of the secret service men koshloff stood from before the panel and i norton my hands neatly manacled behind me was ushered into the room never will i forget the look on lanagan's face for at least three seconds he was jolted out of his traditional immobility his look was mingled alarm surprise and amusement poor norry half banteringly half serious poor old blunderbuss i have certainly got him in a fine mess him and his sick wife at home 
i was so glad to see that nothing had happened to him that i paid little attention to the other two for the moment i was telling him how i waited until twelve fifteen and had just determined on telephoning headquarters for brady and wilson when standing as i supposed well concealed i was suddenly pinioned by two figures that seemed to start up from the earth handcuffed and hustled across the street into the room where we now are i must compliment you on your organization said lanagan ironically bowing toward kozloff around that gentleman's bearded lips played the faintest trace of a mocking smile i could fancy how that smile ground into the proud soul of lanagan the secretary was growing impatient the ten minutes mr lanagan he queried lanagan turned and looked at me a long time you should have obeyed orders he said finally i told you to give me until twelve not twelve fifteen it was the first time in his life lanagan had ever criticized me and it cut to the quick i knew then how bitter his disappointment was what is your proposition he said turning abruptly to the secretary whom i had at once recognized as well as kozloff i haven't any proposition mr lanagan it is simply that neither the russian government nor our government can afford to let the world power know that the secretary of state journeyed incognito across the american continent to reach a diplomatic agreement with russia don't you realize what the publication of that unprecedented thing would mean my only proposition is a declaration you hear most important information it would undoubtedly make a splendid news sensation to-morrow morning but you cannot possibly see the great dangers you would involve your country in you might as well sit on a barrel of giant powder and drop your cigar and expect to save so much as a collar button as to print that story now and avoid war my being here was absolutely a matter imperative for certain sufficient reasons it was necessary that i present myself to mr koshloff in person that is all i know newspaper men among the washington correspondents i number many warm friends i will take the judgment upon myself of placing you both upon your honour if i permit you to go free from here your lips are inviolately sealed for all time upon the contents of that telegram so far as i am concerned that cannot be used until such time as this trouble has been adjusted or let me say until the present administration is out of power in washington into the stillness that followed i could distinctly hear lanagan's teeth grind together those remarkable eyes of his seemed fairly to emit a stream of fire they blazed so fiercely upon koshloff and the secretary he threw a sweeping glance around the room it was a look for all the world like you see in the eyes of a caged tiger when he is aroused for my part there was a quick drop some place under my diaphragm i was thinking of my sick wife and the consequences to her of being held a state's prisoner his hand went to his pocket and he half drew his revolver but it was rather a subconscious act i think than any deliberate design to use it for government after all is a potent thing we fight for it and die for it it was a splendid and natural influence not to be lightly tossed from us and here sat one of government's highest representative lanagan's hand dropped to his side that is better said the secretary for really mr lanagan you cannot move from this room until we say the word you are as helpless as though you were shackled it is late and we have important work to do your answer it was almost pitiable to see lanagan then he of a score of brilliant newspaper victories the genius of his craft who found no situation too difficult to solve that striking figure in the newspaper life of the west who knew no duty save to his paper who embodied the best and the highest ideals that tradition gives to the gentlemen of the fourth estate was beaten the glow had left his eyes and his voice was dispirited as he said you have my word mr secretary but on one condition that carlo's life be spared and that you start him back with your answer it was no fault of his there is only one man in town who could have got that pin from him and i can hardly blame carlo's for losing it once kid monahan wanted it that condition must be granted mr koshloff said the secretary koshloff hesitated 
the wearer of the pin understands the penalty he began curtly i know but in this case i personally request it it is granted said koshloff definitely lanagan was morose and savage the secretary proffered cigars which lanagan impatiently refused there is one thing that i would like however he said with but faint show of graciousness and that is this pin it will not be worn i would like it as a memento as something tangible to exhibit some day when i may tell this story as proof in support of possibly one of the most unusual experiences of myself or any other newspaper man there are but two in existence said koshloff soberly this one belongs to our ambassador at washington it was sent to me for use in receiving the imperial message the other is in the possession of the czar and will be worn by the receiving courier at st petersburg the penalty attaching to the loss of the pen either to myself or my agents are well they are somewhat stringent and with the single exception of carlos have always been enforced lanagan snapped the patent clasp and handed the pen to koshloff you see if i lost it with the slightest inflection on the pronoun there would be no czar of this particular bailiwick to pardon me as you pardoned carlos mr koshloff we walked the long distance back to town and dropped in at blank lanagan had not addressed a word to me i knew better than to attempt to draw him into conversation i could feel that he was working the thing over and over again in his mind he suddenly burst forth passionately i could have beaten them i could have beaten them and they didn't convince me at that that the story should not have been printed there's too much of this one man for the nation stuff in our government anyhow it was a month before lanagan told me that it was because of my wife's feeble health that he feared to take the risk of having us both bottled up for a month by manoeuvring further for freedom and had added merely another argument to prove that your true reporter should not marry and as if to justify the truth of lanagan's assertion to me that the story should have been printed within three days the japanese fleet scorpion-like had struck and crippled that unsuspecting and unready russian flotilla yeah flanagan had cried to me in furious disgust as he ripped the front page of the inquirer with his seven-column warhead to tatters statesmen diplomats give me one live reporter and i'll teach the whole gang of them the right way do you suppose for one single solitary coruscating second that if those japs knew the secretary was hobnobbing with the russian envoy right here in san francisco that the blow would have been struck well i tell you no i wouldn't even have had to print the message the story of the meeting was enough well the time limit set by the secretary has long since expired so here is the suppressed story of the ambassador's stick-pin the finest biggest cleanest in its elements of any of his whole career as lanagan mourned to me more than once End of story five.